Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 118 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with returning guest Doug Oster about how to tell when fruits and vegetables are ripe and when to harvest them. The plant profile is on okra, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode, we're joined by returning guest Doug Oster. He has been on the podcast before talking about summer vegetable gardening and tomatoes. Today, we're going to talk to him all about when and how to harvest and that really tough question, right, Doug, of when is it ripe and when is it edible? Yeah, that's for sure. It always is a a quandary. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess not with everything, but yeah, when do I pick it? You know, mm-hmm. do I pick it when it's small? Do I pick it when it's big? Uh, the, the When you think about harvesting, you know, for normal people that aren't gardeners, I always hear a lot of like, wow, it looks as big as like something from the store, you know, as if that's a surprise <laughs> from what's coming out of the garden. <laughs> yeah. And I think what many of us have learned from is the store. You know, luckily, if we were at farmer's markets or had some farm or gardening experience as a child, we might have that. But for most of us, we're measuring up against almost an impossible standard sometimes because, you know, some of those fruits are not going to be as perfect or as big. But then when it does or it exceeds the quality of the grocery store, then you get a nice surprise, right? Oh, yeah. It might not uh, look like the perfect produce, but it's going to taste 10 times better than anything you you pull out of the store. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I like to harvest in the morning. I don't know about you, but I I find that everything I I harvest, if I can get it in the morning, is always better. Uh, You know, it's it's been sitting there in that nice cool overnight and has the most moisture that it's going to all day. So I'm a big proponent of going out first thing and and picking them Mm -hmm. yeah in the cool of the morning especially in this type of summer heat that we've been having is a great time to be harvesting but you know a lot of us if you're working full-time outside the home and you just run home and grab a few things for the dinner table that's always nice too yeah it doesn't always you know it's just like watering you know I, i always tell people to water in the morning but you can't always do things that way. You know, it's better that you get water on when you can, and it's better that you go out and harvest when you can before that's the, that's the thing you have to worry about. I think for the most part is if the plant is too old, you know, did I wait too long? You know, how long, you know, when you're growing lettuce in the spring, it's, it's no worry. But then when things get hot, it's like, you've got to really look at it. And think, okay, should I just harvest this all or Mm -hmm. tomorrow is it going to bolt and go to seed? Uh, And so, you know, what really breaks my heart is is seeing like cucumbers that are all turning yellow and everything. And the the gardener didn't get to it. And I have a friend, he has a really tiny garden, but he's always complaining about how much work it is, although he loves what he gets out of it. But when I go over there and I look into that cucumber patch and I see like 10 cucumbers that have just been left there, I'm like, oh, come on. You know, I mean, what, what did you what did you plant for? You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know how it is with certain things like cucumbers. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going to have a lot of cucumbers, but it's it's fun to use them. It's fun to give them away. You know, I love to make cucumber salad. And you know what? Not something we've never talked about that I found out about you probably a year or two ago is our affinity for Duke's mayonnaise. And so I make this cucumber dressing with basil, half Greek yogurt and half Duke's mayonnaise. (laughs) And uh, whenever you find somebody, okay, not only are we connected through gardening, but now we're also connected through like our obsession with a certain type of mayonnaise. Hey, (laughs) I think we're friends for life, Kathy. (laughs) 
Yeah, and more Dukes the better. And and we're not sponsored by Dukes, and I don't think you are either, Doug. But no, we, absolutely not. You but know, we could. We, I'd accept a you know a box. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> And now they've come out with, and I know we're way going way off topic, Mm -hmm. come out with like different types of Duke's mayonnaise, like with spicy pepper in there. And so now I'm mixing that with regular Duke's and dipping potatoes in it. So uh, when you do harvest your (laughs) great stuff from the garden, think about Duke's mayonnaise because it's a different animal. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So that's our little commercial segment for today. And yeah, free ad, free ad for Duke's. And and Duke's does make things taste a lot better sometimes Mm -hmm. and, you know, stretches it out too, Mm -hmm. you know, but so you were talking about your friend who had let some of the cucumbers go a little past harvest time. And I was just going to say that it, it's this, it's the time of year. You're busy with going back to school. Your, you know, work is cranking back up. And then that's when the garden is at its peak for production. So you can't really skip a day. You can skip maybe a day once in a while, but you've got to be checking under that, those cucumber <laughs> leaves. And the, and we're going to talk about zucchinis in a second. And you really can't skip a couple days on the zucchinis. Yeah, you'll end up with a baseball bat. Or, mm-hmm. you know, we always say here in Pittsburgh that during the end of the season, if you stop too long at the stop sign, you're going to end up with a bag of zucchini or tomatoes in the back seat. So that's just what happens here. Hey, I'll take either right now. <laughs> I, I, ironically, with a uh, what's been happening with pollinators, sometimes people are completely mystified by not getting zucchini. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if you've got pollinators, if you, you know, you're going to have like your typical harvest, but if you don't, for some reason where you live, or if the pollination isn't what it should be, that can be, that can be frustrating uh, because, you know, everybody says, you know, Oh, zucchinis. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I can make another zucchini bread or a zucchini this or zucchini that. Hmm, Very true. And we can hand pollinate if you think that your pollinators didn't do the job just to make sure. Um, So you can identify those male and those female blossoms and marry them together, so to speak, and make sure you get some pollination. But yeah, I've heard from a lot of readers and listeners that their squashes, their melons, their cucumbers haven't been as prolific as in previous years. Yeah, I'm lucky that I have uh, honeybees in in the garden. And as long as I've had honeybees in there, and, and of course, honeybees are in decline, but also are native pollinators. So, but having honeybees in the garden has increased my vine crop production immensely. Uh, you know, they never bother me. They're right in the corner of the garden. You know, you just, you don't want to bump the hive. You don't want to threaten them, but they're not interested in us. They're just doing their job. And boy, do they. One of the ironies of cucumbers is, and some of these other vine crops is that cucumber beetles are great pollinators, but they're spreading the the bacterial wilt disease. So uh, in today's climate of you know, begging for pollinators, you have to consider that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are a bit of a menace though. And and then powdery mildew on top of that, and the vine starts to decline quickly, then you just have to go with whatever is in developing at that point. Yeah, I'm kind of at the end of it for my cucumbers. You know, I picked Mm -hmm. three this morning, you know, but, you know, probably two weeks ago it was, you know, eight or nine. Uh, and so they're kind of slowing down. They've kind of collapsed the trellis. You know, uh, <laughs> I built this trellis. I got this, the worst mistake I ever made was some guy gave me some bamboo and I stuck it up in the woods and I harvest as much as I can to, to build stuff for the garden. But a lot of times it doesn't harden up right. And then it kind of gets soft. And then the, whatever I built is falling down. <laughs> That's, I had to go up and get some more bamboo this morning just to give them some support uh, cause whenever I plant something like cucumbers and I want them, I want them growing up. This is one of the things that I try and do to keep, keep them away from the cucumber beetle. Even though that beetle flies, it spends a lot of time on the ground. And so I always grow them up, but I always grow like another vine crop with it, like scarlet runner beans or morning, gl- some crazy morning glory or just something to mix in there and just to give it some, uh, a different look. Hmm. 
Yeah, and that's also can lessen the powdery mildew that we just mentioned because that can give it some more air circulation as well. Yeah. Um, but as far as the harvesting, you know, it's specifically cucumbers. Mm -hmm. I always love to get them when they're smaller. You know, I know that you, again, you, you want to bring in, you know, that's what, sometimes when I'm bringing this stuff in, I'm like, well, I better, I better wait. Cause I want to impress everybody with the, you know, how impressive this, whatever it is I'm picking. But for cucumbers, I just, I love them when they're small. I grow mostly pickling types. Uh, just because I, I like them that way. Uh, they're easy to peel. And, and like I said, I make a lot of cucumber salads in, in the summer. And for me, smaller is better for the, for the cucumbers. But mm -hmm. there, you know how it is, as we've, as we've said. You're always going to have some underneath there that you didn't see. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one or two is okay. But for my friend to have <laughs> eight or nine, I have to scold him. <laughs> yep. And I would say, so cucumbers are one of those edibles that you can kind of eat at any stage once it's formed. So there's a lot of edibles like that, that you just have to make the decision that it's big enough now, right? So once it's been pollinated and it starts to form, you could eat it right after that stage. And then you might want to wait till, you know, it's got a little bit of size on it, but it's still tender and sweet. Um, and that's very true also for zucchini, which the Italian main name really means little. <laughs> the eeny part but people do let it grow to a bit larger stage but you can harvest that zucchini or that squash at a smaller tender stage uh more tender stage than a lot of us are and you know i'll do that a lot of times just nibbling on it out in the garden you know maybe it's not technically a harvest as far as bringing it in but it's like oh you know put on some little zucchinis or put on some little cucumbers you know and there's a hundred of them and so like, oh, I'll take a few of these little ones while I'm out here because they're so good when they're little like that. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing with okra because okra is one of those that, again, you have to be picking every day, if not every other day. And you want them while they're still small and tender before they get a little too large and woody. Um, so I'll just snap them off and just snack on them right there in the garden most of the time. Well, I'm going to ask you, what else do you do with your okra? Uh, you know, I've only grown it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Again, don't really have the sun for it, but I have lots of friends that, that grow it. What is your number one use for okra? I would say fried. So just like slicing it into coins, you know, mm -hmm. widthwise and a little cornmeal batter and just mm -hmm. fry that up. So mm -hmm. good. That sounds great. <laughs> and then you can make your, your Duke's dip and dip them in there. That's yeah. even better right yeah. there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Another, another free ad for Duke's. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are averse to okra because they think it's slimy, but, you know, frying it up or eating it fresh while it's still green, fresh picked, that's kind of the secret. You know, unless you want to release that mucilage to thicken up a sauce, there's no reason to keep it around, you know, in your kitchen for a day or so. You want to eat it right away. That well, makes good sense. Like, like most of the stuff that we harvest. Mm -hmm. So related to the cukes and zooks, we can move to the their relatives or their cousins, the squashes and pumpkins. So that one, I think it depends on, do you want those squashes for eating right away or for storage? And, and when do you pick your squashes? Yeah, you know, for winter squash, I'm basically, all mine are basically for storage. And, uh, I want them to get, you know, as mature as they possibly can so that they will store well and, you know, never want to knock the uh, stem off it, you know, leave that on there, that kind of hard stem on there. And, and they'll store for a long, long time. And that, to me, that's just like your number one, like winter vegetable, you know, store as well. Um, you know, you can make so much out of it. You know, I like making squash soup. And, you know, once they get to a certain point, they're, they're, they're going to last for seriously for months inside. Mm -hmm. So you're going to cut them off of the stem a few inches higher than like where it's connected. Yeah. I want to leave that like a uh, mm -hmm. handle on there. Uh, that is supposed to help them store and, and mine store pretty well that way. So I try not to knock that off there. Yeah, and I think another tip that 
I see a lot of newbies doing is picking up like their pumpkins, especially heavy pumpkins by that, what we call a stem or handle. Right. Always pick it up from the bottom because it's heartbreaking when you snap that off by accident. You know, it's funny with the pumpkins too. So many times here in mid Atlantic States, uh, they're, they're ready way or way before Halloween. <laughs> And so I get a lot of questions about that. Well, how long will it last? And and it all depends on how you're storing it. But a lot of people in my area are are picking their pumpkins right now uh, because they're you know they've turned they're orange. Then they don't want critters to get them. That's the other thing too when you're thinking about harvesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have not had a rabbit in there yet, but I've seen one around. And around the front gate too, you know, like as soon as you come around a corner, all of a sudden that rabbit darts away. I know it wants in there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm expecting one day for my peas to be gone, for my pe beans to be gone or, or something like that to happen. So a lot of times I'll harvest as a preventative, just if I'm worried that something might get in there. I even had, you know, this is the first time this ever happened, but the deer got in somehow it's a fenced in garden and it looked like teenagers just destroyed the, I mean, got caught up in the tomato cages. It, yeah. It was quite a disaster and, you know, ate all the flocks, but you know, the flocks came back and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my vegetable garden is like many are, are filled with flowers too. That's part of the charm of, of having a garden is mixing things up. I go, oh, that same friend though, that has those cucumbers. He says, you can't do that. You can't have flowers in the vegetable garden, the flowers go out here and the vegetables go in here. So you've got lots of rules about gardening, but for gosh sakes, pick your cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I would say that is a big pressure on harvesting timing is trying to beat the creatures to it. And that's especially true in some of the other edibles we're going to talk about later, like figs and other things where you're just trying to get them, you know, when it's pretty ripe, but you can't wait almost till it's perfectly ripe because the other creatures in the world also have their same eye on that, on that exact timing. And that happened to me with um, sugar baby watermelon last year. I had these beautiful, perfect, several melons on a vine and the vine started to dry up and brown at the tip, which is one of your indications, right? That it's, it's becoming ripe and turn the melon over and lo and behold, it was completely hollowed out. Yeah. It was just completely scraped out by some rodent or the other. Um, just made almost like a home in there and had had a good old time, but beat me to it. Well, I'm I'm dealing with that right now with my pawpaws. So pawpaws are a, a native fruit. And, you know, I have this little circle of other obsessed pawpaw growers. And they're like, well, I'm, I've started picking. I've started picking because... For something like a pawpaw, the reason you rarely see them in the market is that they don't store well and they ripen slowly. And you you've got to you've got I got to go up there and it's a you know quite a hike up to this orchard. I have to go up there every day and shake that tree because if I don't, a groundhog or a raccoon or something's going to get it as mm -hmm. soon as it softens up. And they're so fragrant that you know that's that's the other clue on on a pawpaw although they're up there quite a ways you know they have to, if you just shake the tree a little bit when they're ripe they'll come down uh, i once i once had a new videographer when i worked for one of the newspapers here and he only lasted two weeks uh, the first week we were harvesting pawpaws and he requested a uh, bike helmet because you're shaking that tree and the, something the size <laughs> of a potato is falling down and you hear them thump 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 all around you so he wanted the helmet and we had a nice, we got a good half bushel that day of, of pawpaws. Uh, and so a lot of times it's when, you know, in that case, it's when the plant is ready to discard its, uh, what, what is basically its seed delivery system. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's when I know that that one is, it, it's ready. But if I don't go up there every day, I'm going to be extremely disappointed. Uh, you know, pawpaws are one of the last seasonal things left. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I don't care how busy I am. I'm going up there every day. I want my pawpaws. I see them up there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I would say that that same method is for mulberry trees as well in the in the late spring, where I just put a tarp down under the mulberry and just shake the branches, and then the ones that are ripe are released. So that makes it a lot easier to harvest. Where you just um, put a tarp over your car and then, <laughs> and, and then shake the mulberries off so they don't uh, get all over in your car. That you could do that too, and or just collect that tarp full of mulberries and make some mulberry wine or something with them there too. You go. <laughs> yep, and similar to the pawpaws are, are the figs that we mentioned earlier. When you want to get to them before you know, a flock of birds comes and just strips all the figs off, which happened to my fig yesterday. So I was, I was getting them pretty good, you know, picking every other day. Um, and so indication of fig ripeness is the turning a color, depending on the variety, but also the fig becomes heavy and kind of bends down um, where it was kind of sticking up, right? And then that tells you that it's full or that it's got that kind of sticky sap on the end, that can be another indication. But I find by that point, the creatures have gotten the figs. If you yeah, uh, in my case, it's it's ants. You got to keep, mm. keep, keep them away from the ants. And so, again, with, with a fig, similar to a pawpaw, you want it to be that perfect ripeness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm gently squeezing it <laughs> to see it uh, where we're at, but... Uh, I'm not picking yet. You're a little bit ahead of me, but I, I actually, that's so funny. I took some pawpaws down to my local nursery today and I traded them for some figs, <laughs> which I didn't know. I didn't even know the figs were there. And I said, would you like some pawpaws? And she says, yeah, would you like some figs? And I'm like, yeah, when they're ready, she goes, I have them right here. So I Yay. got to sit there eating three or four nice figs. Perfect. And so for other uh, tree fruits, like pears and apples and peaches, we can touch on them pretty lightly and just say, you know, you're familiar with the firmness of them, you know, pears will ripen a little bit after you pick them versus apples or peaches. Um, I guess peaches will, will ripen a little bit too more after you pick them. So you can pick them a slightly under ripe, right? Yeah. For peaches, for me, I just do the taste test. You know, when you have a tree full of peaches, it's mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm just going to bite into one. You know, I'll start with the squeezing. If it's hard as a rock, it's like, okay, forget it. Uh, that's another one too, where critters will give you uh, an indication that it's time to pick because mm -hmm. you'll see a couple of them laying down there and they've already tried them. You know, they're like, okay, let's, you know, that'd be like a raccoon. Let's, let's try it, see how it is. Uh, not quite ready. I'll be back tomorrow. So, you know, squeezing it, tasting it, smelling it, uh, that all works. You know, mm -hmm. apples for the most part for me, uh, I'll do the same thing. You know, you got an apple tree and you're just like, well, oh, it looks about ready. Uh, give it a squeeze, give it a bite. And like, yeah, it's good to go. Mm -hmm. And some of them, especially some of the more heirloom or old fashioned ones, they might get a little bit of a color blush that indicates on their shoulders when they're ripe. Um, but some are harder to tell than others. And it's basically just experience and, and knowing your fruit tree and checking on it every couple of days. You know, there's a late one that I really like called Pink Lady. Uh, that, uh, some friends that run a, a big apple orchard turned me on to it. And I've just, I've really fallen in love with that one. Plus mm -hmm. it's a little, a little different. Yep. You know, apples are kind of like fashion. They, they come and go. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, uh, in Pennsylvania, the, uh, oh, it just went out of my head. There's peaches here. Where do they come from? I can't remember. Chambersburg, Chambersburg ah. peaches. You know, there's mm -hmm. always like these certain things like that that become really super popular. And Chambersburg peaches, you know, it's their, it's what's ever in their soil. Everyone from the east side of the state to the uh, west side always is clamoring for Chambersburg peaches. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an apple that's really popular, but if you have one like Pink Lady that's just kind of off the beaten path, uh, and I said, it, it, it's ready late, uh, but just a super tasty, just eat off the apple or eat off the tree apple. Uh, and, but you can do all sorts of things with it. It's, it's good pie apple. Uh, it's just a very versatile apple. Yeah. And I like that. It's a smaller size, like easier to eat like yeah. a snack size Yeah, versus like a pie size or you would have cut it up into slices. 
Well, let's turn to berries because I think that's one of the easiest maybe categories of when to harvest. Um, since almost all of them, it's the color that tells you. So, and the, and the name even tells you blackberry, blueberry, you know, red raspberry or yellow raspberry. Um, maybe we can even touch on strawberries. Yeah, for me, for raspberries, I'm going out and I, I, I test. It might change color, but if it's if it resists a little bit when I'm pulling it off, I'm waiting a day. I want the that berry and all the berries I grow for the most part are for my wife. Not that I don't like berries, but I, I don't know what it is. I'm just like, again, I'm always coming in from the garden. Like, look what I have. Look at look what I've done. Look what look what's happened. Here's some <laughs> berries. <laughs> uh, and she loves sweets. So uh, I want that raspberry and the blackberries to be fully along. When I was a kid, we would spend summers when the blackberries were ready, just getting bucket and bucket filled and bring them back to one house where the mom would make blackberry pies and everybody in the neighborhood got a blackberry pie. And, oh man, I miss that. <laughs> Yum. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. I would say when the fruits on the berries release easily is a good indication for those type of berries and blueberries, you want them dead blue. Oh, I've, already, yeah. I've learned my lesson on that over the few years. Whereas service berries, I don't know if you have a, a service berry tree. Done, I, do. I do. They can be a little more on the burgundy red side and still be sweet versus the blueberry, where if it's not dead blue, you've got that tartness in it. And for service berry, I rarely beat the birds. You know, again, that's a time, that's a time of the year for me that for some reason, I'll be walking by the service bear. I'll be like, oh, there's a few that have changed. I'll have to check back tomorrow. And then tomorrow, most of them have changed and the birds have just taken those berries. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Yeah. And the fact that they're more ready earlier when it's just red with a little bit of blue in them, you can beat the birds that way, I found out. Yeah. So you can have them in versus when they're totally blue and then yeah, the birds have taken them all away. Whenever whenever that happens for me, I just say, Well, I'm growing that tree to help the birds. So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and they can they can have those. And so for strawberries, I think most of us know, you know, you wait for the, the color to fully develop. Again, you want to beat the wildlife to them. Uh, but there are some strawberries that are ripe when they're white. There are a couple varieties, so you have to know what variety you planted. I have some little wild ones that are white, actually, um, that I, I actually brought them with me from my old garden. And they're really tiny, uh, but they're pure white and super tasty. Just, you know, they never make it inside. They're, you know, it'd be too much of a pain to pick. You know, you pick a bucket of those little strawberries you'll be out there for three days hmm. uh, but you just you, you when you see them you pick them you nibble on them they're awesome so you would just taste one to know whether it's right because that would be so hard to tell you know they start off real small and mm -hmm. then they get they get to a certain size and actually the squeeze test for them works pretty well hmm. you know you start you're gonna you're gonna pop a few in your mouth and make sure but you know a lot of this too is experience, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you've been growing little white strawberries for 40 years, you kind of know when they're ready, you know, you kind of just take a look at them and you kind of know the timing and yeah, you'll taste them and everything, but you're like, no, nah, those look pretty ready to me. You know, I, I'm pretty sure we'll be harvesting those in the next uh, few days at least. And that's so true, Doug, that it helps to go out there with an experienced gardener uh, because if you're a new new gardener you just don't know so sometimes it's just like a little subtle texture or color variation that you recognize after years and years of picking them and just a well, little bit different size that brings up for me tomatoes because mm -hmm. there are certain tomatoes that they'll color but they are not in their prime until they're a couple days past that coloring up and it's not even a texture thing uh you know coming to mind right off the bat is one called Juliet. It's a 1999 all America selection. Uh, it's kind of a cross between a grape tomato and a plum tomato. It's that size, it's extremely prolific and everybody was raving about it, but people would complain that like, what are you guys all raving about? I mean, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And the trick on that one and, and several others like that 
is they have they have to be a little overripe to to really hit their stride and that's only really from experience you know that that you can tell somebody because the same thing happened to me and i started picking them I'm like well these are okay but they're not fantastic and then you know just by accident you start to see oh my gosh this does deepen up a little bit this does soften up a little bit and all oh, the flavor is so much different not all tomatoes are like that but there are plenty that that are and so experience and growing something you know that's part of it too mm -hmm. yeah and i think for the different tomato varieties that some are a peachy color some are orange to know that that's the full color and full depth of it and then you have the tricky ones right like green zebra you're like when <laughs> is that green zebra ripe because it's still green all those green ones you know i can remember the first time i grew green zebra how worried i was like what is this going you know what is this going to taste like? how am i going to know but again if you pick tomatoes you know just your typical red tomato you know one of your one of your cues is just the softness that green zebra it does change color mm -hmm. it's just you have to recognize the colors being changed you know you really have to observe and again that's a big part of gardening is observing what's happening if you look at the difference between a green zebra that is not ripe and one that's ripe it's night and day you know you get that just that little bit of kind of yellowish orange on that green zebra that that keys you off and of course the just the, the texture of it but that one definitely is a leap of faith you know yeah, yeah you got a tomato that turns from green to red like Okay, it's ready, but you've got one that's going green to a little bit different green. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the indications for me on green zebra, besides that kind of orangishness that it takes on, is it becomes a little heavier. So it's not just that it, the texture of it, when you squeeze it, gives a, gives a little the skin, but it actually feels heavier if you hold it in your hand. I need to grow some more green tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I remember when green zebra was just all the rage. But there's so many other cool green ones out there. Oh uh, yeah, there's I'm some gonna, great I'm, ones. Ne next year, I'm gonna I'm making a note right now. Green <laughs> green tomato in corner. Okay. Exactly, and that's one of the great benefits of green tomatoes. We were talking about earlier beating the crit critters to it, and maybe some human thieves as well, because they won't know it's ripe, but you will, because because you'll be watching it and you'll see that color turn and you'll see that texture and firmness and that weight turn so you'll know when to pick it but the squirrels and birds and maybe even raccoons will leave it alone uh squirrels and chipmunks have mm -hmm. become a real problem here i don't know what they think it is i don't know if they're looking for water yep they're just nibbling a little bit on those red ones and that's another i didn't even think of that that's another great reason to go with green and, mm -hmm. and and white you know it's been a long time since i've grown snow white cherry that might be one to think about yeah and that's what especially when you're in an urban location like i am in a community garden with lots of eyes on your fruits and vegetables that's why i always tell people to pick some of those different varieties because people will leave them alone and not think that they're ready that's a great idea that and and uh and when you're growing super hot peppers label them as sweet and that'll that'll uh that'll stop anybody after they have that first taste <laughs> of a uh, carolina reaper oh yeah they'll never come back to the garden so that does bring up pepper ripeness so there's peppers that go through phases that go from green to yellow or orange to red and you can pick them while they're still green and eat them right but you want to wait for that next phase of sweetness maybe or that next phase of hotness depending and i know people who just can't stand the green pepper stage um i'm fine with it at the green pepper stage and sweet peppers but what do you think doug uh i always want to wait for it to change that's why i tell people in in our climate you know one of the most popular green peppers for people to grow is uh, california wonder but it takes so long to to ripen. Um, I like something that, that ripens in about 75 days as opposed to 90 if possible. And if I can, I want to wait. I, I, I grew a, a new heirloom this year. It's called Buena Mulato. And it starts purple, turns orange, and then turns red. And it's actually hotter earlier than later, which wow. is really weird. 
Yeah, mellows out. I've never heard of a pepper go the opposite way. It might be the, that, you know, that I'm eating the purple ones raw and I'm cooking the red ones. I don't know. I, I haven't had enough time to play with it, but I've, I've, it's been fun to pick them at all three stages to see how the flavor is. Definitely the flavor is better when they get to red. They really sweeten up. There's got a little bit of kick to them, but nothing that's going to, you know, make you sit up and go, whoa, it's just <laughs> kind of a nice, ah, all right. I had a little hot pepper tasting thing the other day and we had habanero, that buena mulata, and then one I love called sweet, uh, super chili mm. and, uh, Super Chili, 1988 All-America Selection. I know that they've come up with a better one since then, but I'm a creature of habit. And this one puts on peppers. I don't care where you plant it. You can plant it under a tomato plant. It'll put peppers on. And it's, it's again, you can pick them when they're green. They those, those really get their heat going when you get that bright red. And you can see, actually, if you wait too long, uh, it doesn't have that firm texture you know it starts to really soften up and it's gone past its prime and so that one puts on so many peppers that eventually all i'll be doing is is dehydrating them with all the windows open in the house otherwise it's like tear gas wow yeah definitely that or out in your garage i love that smell though you know i wait till everyone's gone i fire up the dehydrator and even with the windows open the first two three hours are like oh, oh. <laughs> But there's something spectacular about it too. I don't know what it nice. is. I don't know if I could do it with Reapers, no. with, you know, with a Carolina yeah. Reaper. I, I think I, I think they'd find me in the study, you know, <laughs> passed out, <laughs> gasping for air. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, let's um, since we're on the Solanacea family, let's hit a couple of those relatives like tomatillo and eggplants. Do you have any tips for ripeness on those? Uh, for tomatillos, I grew some really cool purple ones uh, last year, and I think it's when I'm, – I'm trying to remember when I was having the best luck picking them because I haven't grown them a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, you know, I, you know, when I see something crazy like a purple one, I'm like, oh, okay, I got to do this. And I think it's when that fruit kind of separates a little bit from the uh, papery sheath. Is that what you found? Yeah, when the husk starts to split open – um, because they never really get that tomato tender stage. You're kind of waiting for them, right? They pretty much do stay very firm. Um, so it's kind of when that splits open that you could have them at that point. And for me, for the eggplant, it's, it's right after it changes color. And again, hmm. the squeeze the squeeze test. There's something about it when it ripens. It gets a little softer. And we love eggplant at, the, at this house. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's Italian. I'm Italian by marriage. And uh, we have to have our eggplant. And I have a, a couple like miniature eggplant plants out there, but they're putting on pretty decent sized eggplants. Yeah. That's another thing I wish I grew more of because I think they are one of the most beautiful vegetables. Hmm. Uh, you know, since we love them, you know, not everybody loves eggplant. You know, you got to kind of warn people when you're, okay, this is a pasta with some eggplant in it. And some people will go run for the hills. Uh, but as much as we love them, and there are so many just cool looking varieties, but there's, you know, there's only so much room. Mm -hmm. uh, but that I've, I've converted so much of my garden to big containers to just try and add more and more things that I love. Yeah. And as you can tell, I just, I love to grow weird stuff, you know, so something that looks a little different, something that's going to, uh, especially when kids come visit the garden, I, I always love to get them to take that leap of faith. Whenever you have kids come to the garden and you're at harvest time, just tell them, you can spit it out if you don't like it. And that takes all the pressure off. I'm not kidding you. You remember what it was like to go to the, go, go to someone's house and be served something you didn't any idea what it was. You've never seen it before, mm -hmm. you know, and, and for us, you know, an orange tomato, a white tomato, that's nothing. But for a normal person, a kid, that's like, that's a big leap of faith to taste, taste that different looking fruit when it's harvest time. Mm -hmm. And, when you give them that, that when they're looking you in the eye and you say you can spit it out, you can almost see the weight of the world come off their shoulders because they're going to some crazy guy's garden. They don't know I'm going to be feeding them dandelion greens and <laughs> uh, purple tomotillas and yep. orange tomatoes. But by the end of the, the, the visit, they're like, wow, that was cool. And actually, believe it or not, 
my neighbors, uh, the two kids are grown now. They're in their 20s. But the parents told me, like, them coming up here changed the way that they looked at food because you know how you are when you're a kid. You just you don't even know if you like it or not. You just look at it or smell it, and you're like, I'm not eating that. Mm -hmm. But when you can get them to just, like I said, take that leap of faith, it does kind of open their horizons up for, for eating different things. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you frame it like, you know, this is something that Baby Yoda would like <laughs> or something, <laughs> give them something that they can relate to. You know, this is little dragon eggs or something with the eggplants that helps them introduce it too. Oh, that's a great idea. So I was going to pivot to root vegetables because this is, that's a real category where a lot of people have, you know, a lot of trepidation. Should I dig this out yet? Is it ready? Um, so maybe we'll start with the easier root vegetables, the carrots and radishes, and being able to tell when those should be dug up. Well, I'm glad you brought up carrots and radishes because in the mm -hmm. spring, I plant both those things together in the same spot. Uh, and, and I've been doing that for years and in the fall, I can't, I can't do that. I'm just, I'm doing basically radishes now. We're too late for carrots for us, but, uh, you know, radishes I'm picking, I, I put that whole packet in. Okay. I'm not going to have another half packet of seeds. I've got 200 of them already sitting in jars in the basement. And so I put the whole packet in and I'm started picking as soon as they come up. I'm using carrots and radishes, whatever comes up as microgreens. And as I keep thinning, mm -hmm. I'm harvesting. So uh, I'm harvesting them when they're really tiny and I'm harvesting them when they're really big. And I'm like in the case of carrots, I'm leaving those in the ground, what's ever left at the end of the season for the winter, just under a thick layer of, of mulch so that I can harvest that during a thaw. I do the same thing with beets, same thing with potatoes. Um, and so with radishes could be just about any size just don't wait too long mm -hmm. they get big and woody and and uh, awful but you know you'll see they, they get to a certain you get to the size you want to use them pull them and again you know the taste test is always the the perfect way to find out where they are as far as uh, crispness and spiciness mm -hmm. the longer you wait usually the hotter they get carrots i i, I feel the same with way about it. I pick them when they're really small if I want them and then I'll wait all season you know and and pull a few big ones again I can come back in and say look I got carrots that look just like they're from the store isn't this <laughs> aren't, aren't I amazing yeah darling aren't I amazing no I, I don't get that just takes the carrots and leaves mm -hmm. yeah and one thing you could tell on carrots and radishes too is kind of what we call the shoulders start to show above the soil and if you're not ready to pick them at that point you know as, as doug is saying you want to leave them in for a little bit for storage you can just fill in with some more soil or, or mulch on top that way it doesn't get a different color like that greenishness at the top of the carrot yeah i would say the same thing for potatoes too mm -hmm. uh but those the the young potatoes uh, that's one of the amazing things about growing potatoes and they call them new potatoes and the smaller ones on the edge before that skin hardens up boy, you can just reach into the sides of your beds and I'm growing potatoes this year in fabric pots and so far so good. I've, I've harvested some of the new potatoes from the outside. I'm, I'm, I'm going to dump the whole thing. You know, I got three of them. I'm gonna, they're 15 gallons. I'm going to dump them all over as soon as the foliage is, is done. And, it's always like, uh, like, <laughs> like a one-armed bandit. When you when you turn that over and see what's out of there, you don't know what you're going to get. Is it going to be a million dollars, or is it going to be three potatoes? Mm -hmm. We'll find out. <laughs> Very true. And I was thinking, in comparison, sweet potatoes. Whereas when you dig out sweet potatoes, they're usually starting to push above the surface, and you can kind of see there's a huge root mound of tubers growing, or not at that point. Yeah, and that's a that's a tough crop for us. You know, you with our um, the length of our season, mm -hmm. you really have to go with uh, something that puts on those potatoes pretty quickly. I, you know, I, some, last year I went to a community garden and I saw they were growing sweet potatoes, and I'm like, half the garden was sweet potatoes, and I was looking at them, and it was end of the season. And I'm like, oh man, this was a you know, you're going to get some sweet potatoes out of here, but you could have used. Uh, this space so much more efficiently mm -hmm. uh you know run those uh 
run those vines towards the edge of the garden, not, not filling up the whole inside of your garden. And so, uh, like I said, you know, that's such a long season crop, uh, without you got to here, you got a full sun and an early variety, something that's going to do it in 90 days, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And you have to factor in the cure time. So that's something we should talk about with, with a lot of that harvesting is there are some things that need curing for a couple weeks before you can store them. And the curing is to harden off the skin for storage, but it's also to increase the sugars and the concentration of starches in them. Well, that's my number one thing when I harvest garlic is that curing and, and curing it right. Um, you know, if you're only growing 20 heads, no big deal. But if you're like me and you're growing 400 heads of garlic and you want it to be, obviously we love garlic here. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want it to last all the way until the next harvest, that curing is critical. And I've been experimenting a lot with that. And, and, and it's always mistakes, these beautiful mistakes. I accidentally left some garlic out in that uh, tool shed last year to almost freezing. And I, and I forgot about it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, because that was curing under this, like barely any humidity, that stuff lasted great. Uh, I still have some sitting in there and, you know, we harvested, you know, last July, you know, not, not July, 2022, July, 2021, there's still a few little heads in there. And so that's part of this too, is, is part of, you know, this, this journey of discovery of gardening on, you know, I've been growing again, I've been growing garlic forever and to just, accidentally leave it out there and see, wow, this stuff, this stuff really lasted, really cured well. Because, you know, if you're curing it outdoors and it's really humid, uh, it's not going to cure in the same way. Mm -mm. Yeah. And it really helps if you can have a cold or cool, maybe not cold, cold and dry situation. Maybe that could be in a garage or a barn. But a lot of us, of course, you know, with small houses, you're not going to just turn one bedroom into your curing laboratory. Right. And, you know, you'll have these periods where you'll have low humidity and then I'm sure you have it where you're at, you know, all of a sudden it's 90 degrees again and, you know, the humidity is oppressive and that's going to, again, affect the curing. Mm -hmm. And same thing with what we we're talking about at the beginning where the, the squashes that you were storing over, the only way I've been able to do it is layers of newspaper and just kind of turn them over every once in a while to make sure a soft spot or rotting isn't developing. Well, you know, back in the day, everybody had a root cellar, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess my old house, 1939, I do have something that could be a root cellar, but it's all filled with old toys and stuff. So I don't think it's going <laughs> to be a root cellar. <laughs> the, the toy and root cellar. Well, uh, one last edible that I think a lot of people ask about and when they can pick it is corn. And so I know that, especially at farmer's markets, I always see these handwritten signs that say, don't open it up. <laughs> it's, it is what it is. And you just have to trust the farmer that they're picking at his peak. But how does he know that it's fully ripe? The time to harvest your corn is the day before the raccoons do. <laughs> Well, uh, let me just tell you a real quick story. It's a heartbreaker. Again, another community garden. And when you're only visiting your corn once a week, the raccoons came and visited, you know, and they'll come every day and they'll open up th the end and, and test it to see what it's like. Mm -hmm. He had the most beautiful, like 12 foot tall corn stalks filled with just completely devastated uh cobs of corn always left were the cobs and the raccoons had just you know went to town i was gonna it's so sad to, to think of him coming and seeing all that time spent so yes you keep looking at the corn also look for indications that raccoons have been there that they have opened that up they'll they'll go to the end of that ear they'll open it up and they'll they'll try it to see if it's how they want it what i like to do is again i'm i'm opening it you know, uh, and I'm, I'm squeezing those, uh, kernels till I see what I want, which is a little bit, uh, milky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say the same thing. You're looking for the tassels at the top to kind of brown off and, you know, 
where it was pollinated and then pulling it back a little bit and using maybe a fingernail or the edge of a tool and seeing if uh, milk exudes when you press on some of the kernels. Tough to grow corn unless you got a lot of space, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of space, a lot of sun. I've basically given up mm -hmm. uh, just because I, I don't have what it needs, you know, uh, but there's, you know, when you think of all the things that you grow in your garden, how wonderful they are, your own homegrown corn is unbeatable oh, yeah. because you, the old saying is the water's boiling when you go out to harvest mm -hmm. uh, because the minute you pull it off, that's the, the stock it's changing from sugars to starches. And that's why the freshest corn is always the best. And the stuff coming from the garden, I don't care where you're getting your corn from. <laughs> you can't beat the stuff you pick in your own garden. Amen. So Doug, thank you for sharing your wisdom in harvesting and experiences and lessons learned. And I know you have a few more projects that you've started since the last time we talked to you on the podcast. Do you want to share some of those with our listeners? Uh, just that I'm teaching a free class every Thursday mm -hmm. for the next nine weeks. It's easy to find at dougoster.com. I do a lot of work for uh, Farm to Table of Western Pennsylvania. They do a lot of great work in trying to connect people with fresh food. And, uh, you know, again, I, I, I love to help people garden. And uh, I, I want everyone to be able to have access to this information. And you don't have to watch the, the class live. It's every Thursday at five o'clock. You can watch it later, but it's interactive. And so we have a lot of fun talking back and forth. In fact, that's my next job today. We're, we're doing this on a Thursday and uh, I'll be teaching that class a little later on today. Excellent. So we'll put a link to that in our show notes. And anything else you want to share with our listeners before we sign off? Well, even though we're talking about harvesting, don't stop planting. Hmm. This is the start of what I call the third season. And for me, it, it is uh, the only season that surpasses it is spring. Fall, you know, is the best time to, for me to be growing so many different cool weather vegetables and planting bulbs and trees and shrubs and perennials. I, I love planting in the fall and especially after we have that first frost where we have we don't have the pests anymore you get plenty of rain not as many pests and and the plants when you choose the right plant for the right place you could be gardening year round excellent advice thank you so much doug thanks kathy that was fun Okra plant profile. Okra, Abulmoschus esculentus, is a fast-growing annual vegetable that loves the heat of summer. It is grown for its edible seed pods, which have a savory flavor similar to green beans. It originated in Ethiopia and was grown by the ancient Egyptians. Okra is a member of the Malviaceae family and is related to cotton, cacao, hollyhock, and hibiscus. You can see the similarities in its hibiscus-like flowers. Okra requires full sun and soil with good drainage. Soak the okra seeds overnight and plant them after the last frost has passed in spring. Harvest each pod with its stem attached. Cut the stem as close as possible to its base using sharp shears. Pick the small pods often and before they become big and woody. If you miss some and wonder if they are still edible, bend back the tip with your thumb. If it snaps off cleanly, they are still okay to eat. Well-established okra plants will tolerate slightly cooler nights in early autumn, but will slow in growth and productivity. Okra plants decline soon after a light frost and should be removed from the garden in fall. The most common okra cultivar is Clemson spineless, which is a green cultivar that is relatively smooth, hence the term spineless. There are also several recent introductions of red okras, sometimes called magenta or purple okra. These taste the same as the green ones, but have more anthocyanins in them, giving them the distinct coloring. Okra, you can grow that.
What's new in the garden this week? Well, over at the community garden, my Tithonia, the Mexican sunflower, is blooming like crazy and attracting so many pollinators. The bees are in love with it. I am deadheading it though because it can reseed prolifically. So that's a little warning to you if you do grow Tithonia to make sure it doesn't take over your whole garden as one of our listeners has advised me. In the home garden, I'm happy to see my roses are starting to rebloom. I think that is due to the bit of cooler nights we've been getting here as we are starting to go into late summer into early fall. And I'm also happy to see some of my toad lilies are starting to bloom as well. In the local gardening world, there is a upcoming local koi show at Meadowlark Gardens in Vienna, Virginia. That is Friday, September 9th through Sunday, September 11th. And that's always a lot of fun to bring the family to and see these huge, beautiful koi on display. And while you're there, you can check out the garden photo show and see some of the winners of our annual photo contest. And that is on display inside the visitor center at Meadowlark. Another local event coming up is on Saturday, September 17th. It is the fall plant sale at Historic London Town and Gardens in Edgewater, Maryland. Uh, The plant sale is an important fundraiser for London Town. They will post the plant sale list on their website, so check that out. And a couple more upcoming events you might want to add to your calendar. That same Saturday, September 17th, is the Fall Grow It, Eat It Fair at Holy Cross Germantown Hospital in Germantown, Maryland. And this is being put on in collaboration with Montgomery College and the Montgomery County Master Gardeners. They are going to have healthy foods, health and nutrition talks, garden to table, growing at home, community resources about food access, and much more. That next day, Sunday, September 18th, the Potomac Rose Society is hosting a virtual talk that is free and open to anybody. You can register for that at potomacrose.org. Um, That is at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and it's a virtual visit to one of the most beautiful rose gardens in Europe. They're going to start with Sweden and England in this webinar. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.